Hi, everybody. Uh, during the last lectures, we discussed laws of conservation, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. And I told you that the way we obtained the laws of conservation uh, uh, was based on the usage of Newton's laws, first of all, uh, the Newton's second law and Newton's third law in uh, the law of conservation of momentum. But actually, the modern approach to conservation laws is based on the emmy uh, theorem, which uh, uh, states that whenever we have some symmetry, there should be a law of conservation corresponding to this symmetry. And every conservation law uh, is actually, uh, actually corresponds to some symmetry. Uh, there are a lot of symmetries in physics. And uh, the most simple sorts of symmetry uh, are the symmetry of space and time. When we say that time is uh, homogeneous, we mean that one moment of time does not differ from other moment of time in the sense that laws of physics do not differ. Laws of physics are the same today and tomorrow and the same as they were yesterday. So as laws of physics are the same, we express this idea by saying that the time is homogeneous. And uh, according to the theorem of Emmy Noether, a homogeneous time results in conservation of energy and the law of conservation of energy. Because homogeneous time is a sort of symmetry uh, in time. And each symmetry corresponds to some law of conservation. So homogeneity in time results in conservation of mechanical energy and the energy as in general, uh, a general form of energy conservation is the result of uh, time homogeneity. Also, if we consider space symmetries, uh, we will notice that there are two different symmetries of, of the space in which we exist, uh, of the three-dimensional space in which we live. The first is the homogeneity of space. Homogeneity of space means that uh, laws of physics are the same in this space area and in any other space area. So if we study laws of physics here on this table, and then we study laws of physics on another table or in another laboratory somewhere, the laws of physics will be the same. It means that the space is homogeneous. It, the space introduces no difference at whatever point we study the laws of physics, at whatever space point we prefer to study laws of physics. And due to this homogeneity uh, of space, according to the theorem of Emmy Noether, the law of conservation of momentum arises. A law of conservation of momentum is due to homogeneity of space. And there is another symmetry in space, uh, the symmetry related to turning in space at some angle. So if we study laws of physics at some laboratory, which is uh, set in this place at certain position, and then we turn this laboratory at arbitrary uh, angle, then laws of physics will be the same. Whatever direction in space we choose, all the directions are equivalent. And this symmetry, symmetry with, respect, with regard to turning in space, is called iso iso isotropic, uh, isotropic symmetry. Uh, the symmetry with regard to turns. This is an iso isotropic symmetry of space. And uh, due to this symmetry, there should be another law of conservation, which we will consider today. And that 
is the law of conservation of angular momentum. <coughs> but before we proceed with the law of conservation of angular momentum, I would like to demonstrate some experiments to you which are related to conservation of uh, momentum and also conservation of energy. If we consider uh, conservation of momentum, you remember that there are all sorts of collisions, including perfectly elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. And here we have some balls which are assumed to be absolutely inelastic because they are covered with that plastic. Well, you see what happens. Before the collision, before the collision, uh, the bombarding ball moves and another ball is at rest. But after the collision, they move together. That's absolutely inelastic collision. And here is another example of perfectly elastic balls. In perfectly elastic collision, kind of, uh, mechanical energy is conserved. And one ball is small and light, other ball is large and heavy. And so we can observe what happens when two bodies of different mass collide. They don't stick together, as in the first experiment. And uh, in such collision, mechanical energy is conserved. And here, mechanical energy is not conserved because some part of energy is transferred to internal energy and heating of the colliding bodies. They are heated when they collide. Also, if we use a heavy ball as a bombarding particle, which bombards uh, the light target ball, then the situation will be the uh, what happens will be quite different. It's different from the first case when the bombarding particle was uh, the light particle with smaller mass. It was different. And in such perfect, in such a perfect elastic collision, uh, mechanical energy is conserved. And here we have much more complicated situation when many balls can collide. And if I let one ball to go down, what happens? The first ball will collide with the second one, and the second one will collide with the, with the third one, and so on. And as the balls have the same mass, all of them are of equal mass, after collision, each ball will stop and remain at rest. So after the first ball strikes the second ball, just over a small interval of time, the last ball will be, will be struck and go away. Well, the amplitude becomes smaller and smaller, and such decaying amplitude indicates that the energy is not perfectly conserved here. The mechanical energy is not perfectly conserved. If I take two balls instead of one, that what happens. Why? Why only two balls? If, if I take three balls, then three balls will rebound at the, another, at the opposite side. Why so? You may take this phenomena to investigate it as your question of choice and explain on all possible collisions in this case. That's not bad, not bad question of choice. Another experimental demonstration is also, also involves collisions, both inelastic and elastic. You know this bench 
that works on the air cushion so that the, bo the two bodies can slide along it without friction. And here we have elastic collision. Let, let's do it slightly faster. The loads slide without friction and so their velocity remains constant and after an elastic collision the velocity is changed to the opposite and then the two loads, two bodies collide again elastically. What, what if we take another load of larger mass? And another side of this body allows to study inelastic collision. That's it. Totally inelastic collision. Mm -hmm. Also, this device allows one to study the motion of two identical bodies connected by a spring. And this arrow shows the position of the center of mass of the two bodies. And if they move somehow... You see that the center of mass moves practically with constant velocity. The velocity of both, uh, the speed of both body, uh, of each body changes in time, but the velocity of the center of mass is practically the same, remaining constant. Certainly, it's not absolutely constant. <coughs> it's not absolutely constant. It's slightly varying in time because it's not easy to find the exact position of the center of mass. It's we, we may uh, find it with some error, maybe plus minus half a centimeter here along this spring. But uh, anyway, it's clear that if one uh, shows exactly the position of the center of mass, then its velocity will remain constant, whatever the motion of other bodies. So after these demonstrations, we will proceed with uh, the main topic for today, which is the law of conservation of angular momentum, which, I, as I told you, is the consequence of uh, the symmetry of space, the symmetry uh, of physical laws with regard to the turning at some angle. Uh, the symmetry of all the directions. It's also possible to say that all the directions in space are equivalent. And therefore, there is the law of conservation of angular momentum. So by definition, angular momentum is a vector equal to radius vector of a given point multiplied by the momentum of this point. So in order to understand this definition, we have to draw some picture. This is the point mass, and it has some velocity. So there is some momentum of this mass. Momentum equal mv. Also, there is some point in space, some reference point, with respect to which we measure the position of this material point. This is point O, and this is radius vector R. 
So the momentum is the vector, and the radius vector is also a vector. And here we have a vector product. Do you know what does it mean, vector product? So far, we discussed only scalar products of vectors. Now we come to vector product. In some textbooks, you will find another notation for the vector product. Sometimes it's denoted by other symbols. But the meaning is absolutely the same. Whether you see this notation or this, that's absolutely the same. Just different ways to write down what people mean under uh, vector product. By definition, this vector is called angular momentum. Uh, if we consider the length of this vector, or its magnitude, by, by definition of vector product, the magnitude of this vector will be the magnitude of vector r times the magnitude of vector p times sine alpha, sine of the uh, angle between these two vectors. First vector is r, and second vector is, is p. You can take any vector, any angle. You can take this angle also, which is pi minus alpha. It doesn't matter. It will not change the result, whichever vector, whichever angle you take. Or you may take even this angle from here to here, even this angle. It will be equal to 2 pi minus alpha. That will be 2 pi minus alpha. The result will be the same. Whatever angle you choose, sine alpha will be the same. So it, you choose whatever angle is convenient. For example, this one. That's as far as the magnitude of this vector is concerned. Uh, in the course of secondary school physics, you was told that the angular momentum equals uh, the momentum times the arm of the momentum. The arm of the momentum is the shortest distance from this point to the line coinciding with the direction of uh, the velocity. So the shortest distance it will be this one. If this, is, if this angle is the right angle, then the length of this section will be h, the arm of, the, uh, of this vector v. <coughs> so in elementary physics course, you were told that angular momentum equals the momentum of the body, p, not a vector, a scalar here in this formula. This is a scalar multiplied by its arm. That's an elementary, elementary school definition of angular momentum. And uh, what about the definition which we have considered before? If you, if you look at this formula, what is R? Uh, what is uh, uh, okay I will I will consider this later when when we will discuss the the torque of the particle the same question will arise then when we consider the torque uh, of a particle and uh, so far as we we have given the definition of angular momentum. <coughs> this is a physical quantity, which describes both the position of the body, uh, which is vector r, radius vector r, and the momentum of the body, that is, its mass and velocity. Both quantities are involved. And both quantities, in general case, may be functions of time. So as this point mass moves, the radius vector may change, 
and the momentum and velocity of the body may change. So both parts of this product, in general case, are functions of time. It means that it's interesting to, to discuss what may be the rate of change of angular momentum, the rate of change of this quantity in, in time. So in order to study the rate of change, we have to take a time derivative of L. What is the time derivative of the product of two functions? First, we have to take time derivative of the first function. And then plus, we have to take the time derivative of the second function. What is r dot? r dot, by definition, is the vector velocity. And what is momentum? This is mv. So here we will have a vector product of velocity and another vector which is directed along the velocity. So that the angle between these two vectors will be 0, and sine alpha, sine of 0, will be 0. So the first term here is 0. And the second term can also be uh, transformed into something better because the rate of change of momentum according to the second Newton's law is just the force acting on the particle. So all this expression becomes a vector product of radius vector showing to the particle times force acting on the particle. And this physical quantity, by definition, is termed the vector of torque acting on the particle. So this is the torque. So we obtained equation which defines the rate of change of angular momentum. And according to this law, the rate of change in time of angular momentum equals the torque of external forces uh, acting on this uh, point particle, point mass. So if we have, again, some center, uh, some reference, uh, some, some origin of the reference system or coordinate system, then we can define the position of a particle m. And if the particle moves along some trajectory, then it has velocity, and uh, it has a momentum. And also, there may be a force acting on this particle of arbitrary direction. For example, a force may be directed, well, anyway, for example, here. And so by definition, vector product 
of radius vector showing to the particle by the vector of force acting on the particle is the momentum of the particle. How to find, how to find the magnitude of this vector m? You know the definition of the magnitude of vector product. You take the first vector, the magnitude of the first vector, the magnitude of the second vector, and the sine of angle between them. So the magnitude of the vector of momentum is just R, F, and sine between these two angles, these two vectors. But what is the direction of this vector? Every vector has a direction along with magnitude. Any vector is characterized by two quantities, direction and magnitude. So how to find the direction of vector m? You probably remember from mathematics that in order to find the direction, you should turn the first vector in such a way that it coincides with the second vector. The first vector is r, and you should turn vector r in such a way as it as it should coincide with the second vector. And if you turn in this way the right screw, then the screw will go in the direction showing to, uh, uh, indicating the direction of the vector product. So the direction of vector product, the direction of vector m, is found by the motion of the right screw. If we turn the right screw, through the smallest angle of rotation of the first vector to coincide with the second vector. So in this case, if we rotate the screw here, the angular momentum will somehow be directed in this way. In order to make it more obvious, I will introduce axis x, y, z. Three axes perpendicular to one another. And if the first vector, say r, is directed here along vector x, and the second vector f is directed here, then rotation of r to coincide with F will be a counterclockwise direction so that the vector product will be directed along vector Z, along the along axis Z. That is as far as the angular momentum rate of change is concerned when we consider a single point, a single material point. Well, single point is important thing, but most, of, most often in practice we encounter systems of points systems of material points, uh, like bodies involving many, many points, like, like solid bodies, for example. Uh, any solid body consists of many millions of material points. Each small particle here is a material point. So also there are systems of material points which are traveling in space independently, like planets in a solar system. It's also a system of material points. So uh, one material point is important, but uh, it's, very, it's, it's always necessary to consider the motion of a system of material points. 
So suppose there are many material points, M1, point M2, etc., etc., and point MK. Angular momentum of a system of material points, by definition, is the sum of angular momenta of each individual material point. So we take the definition of angular momentum of a single point. That will be angular momentum of a single material point. And we sum up all these vectors to obtain the angular momentum of a system of material points. So if we consider the time derivative of this quantity, we obtain that that will be the sum of time derivatives of each individual angular momentum of a single point. And according to the law which we have obtained, the time derivative of angular momentum of single point equals the torque acting on this point. And each torque, by definition, is a vector product of the radius vector of point number k multiplied by a force acting on point number k. And considering further this expression, we should understand that a force acting on each particle can, be, can consist of both internal forces acting between different particles here and external forces. So I will consider both internal forces acting on particle number k and external forces acting on particle number k. So the first term here will correspond to internal forces, and the second term will correspond to external forces. As far as the internal forces are concerned, all of them will cancel. In order to understand it, let's consider two different points, a point, uh, mass number k and some other mass number j. Let there be some forces of interaction, internal forces acting between these two masses. The first force will be directed here and the second force here. So that will be the force acting on particle number k from particle number j and that will be a force acting on particle j from particle k. According to Newton's third law, these two forces are equal in magnitude, but oppositely directed and acting along the same line. In order to calculate the torque of each force, we have to take into account that along with the force, we have to use the radius vector of each particle. So there should be some point O and radius vector showing at each particle, at particle number k, and another radius vector showing at particle number 
g. So if we consider this total sum taken over all the particles, there will be necessarily the two terms related to these two particles. And these two terms, in which include the internal forces, will be written in the following way. Radius vector showing to the first particle times force kg plus radius vector showing to another particle number j times the force jk. And according to, the, to Newton's third law, we will conclude that this expression must be 0. Why? Because each vector product in magnitude equals the magnitude of the first vector and the second and the fourth, and which will, which will equal to the force multiplied by the arm of this force. And the second term also will be equal to radius vector multiplied by the force in the arm of this force. The arm of this force, the arm of this force and force, the, the arm is the same for these two terms. These two forces are directed along the same line. And therefore, the arm of these forces is the same. But the forces are also equal, but opposite in direction. Therefore, all this will be equal to the arm of the force and first force kg plus the second force gk. And as those two forces are opposite in direction, their sum is 0. So this is surely 0. Therefore, all internal forces acting between particles of the particle system will give you a zero term in this total sum because of the third Newton's law. Because any two forces acting in between the two particles of the system are equal and opposite, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And these two forces also, according to the Newton's third law, are directed along the same line so that they have the same arm of the force. And therefore, these two terms here written will have the same magnitude, but opposite signs. So that the sum will be 0. In the same manner, all the internal forces will give you a 0. The all of them will cancel so that we don't have to take them into account here. And what remains? is just the external forces. External forces. All the internal forces will cancel. And what is that radius vector point number k times force acting on point number k? That is a torque. That is a torque acting on point number k. But the torque is due to external forces only. And by definition, the sum of all torques of external forces is the total torque acting on the system from the external forces. That's it, five minute interval now. But I would ask you to remain where you are. We will discuss some important issue. <coughs>
so we continue after this short interval. Uh, what we have proven is that when we consider a system of particles, not a single particle, but a system, then by definition the angular momentum of the system of particles is the vector sum of all the angular momenta of individual particles. And considering this vector sum, we arrived at this result that the time derivative of total angular momentum of the system of particles equals the total torque of external forces acting on different particles of the system. So by definition, this total torque is the vector sum of individual torques applied to each individual particle, to different particles. Different torques act on different particles. And so this is very important law of physics, which says that, first of all, if we have a system of particles, then internal forces should not be taken into account when we consider the rotation of this system of particles. Internal forces are not important because all of them cancel. These two terms here are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. So when we add them, we obtain zero. All internal forces cancel uh, due to Newton's third law. And you remember that Newton's third law states not only the uh, equal magnitudes, but also the fact that the two vectors of interaction between two particles are directed along the same line. That's very important, because we may, we may consider two equal vectors, equal in magnitude and oppositely directed, but acting not along the same line. In this case, such a sum of torques would not cancel, would not give you zero. You obtain zero only because the two forces of interaction are aligned and directed along the same line. And uh, it's important that these two forces will have the same arm, the same arm of the force. Uh, so that, uh, wh why the same arm? Because well, because here, here it's quite uh, the place to discuss <coughs> to discuss the uh, what what sign alpha gives you. So, if this is the alpha, then radius vector r multiplied by sine alpha will give you the arm of the force. And the same here, another radius vector r multiplied by a sign of different angle will give you the same arm of the force. That's why the arm of the force will be the same. And uh, if we consider the uh, magnitude of, uh, if we consider the magnitude of uh, of the vector of torque. The torque sometimes is called a moment of forces. In some textbooks, you will find such a term, moment of forces. It's the same as the torque, just two equivalent terms. So if we consider the magnitude of this force, the magnitude will be the radius vector times the force and sine alpha between them. So this is the sine between the radius vector and the force. And radius vector multiplied by the sine will give you the opposite leg in this right triangle. So these two forces will have the same arm of forces. And the forces are equal and oppositely directed. And the arm is the same. That's why, according to Newton's third law, such a sum of two terms will give you zero for any two internal forces of interaction between the particles of the system of particles. Any two internal forces will give you zero. <coughs>
So all the internal interactions will cancel here, and we obtain such an important law of physics that the total angular momentum of the system of particles changes in time, and the rate of change, that is the time derivative, is defined by the total angular momentum acting on this system of particles. So that you may have different external forces, one applied here, and another applied somewhere else, and another force applied here. So different forces will give you different momenta, but the vector sum of all these torques of these forces, vector sum of all the torques, will give you the total resulting torque of external forces, and that quantity will define the time derivative of angular momentum. That's very important law of physics. What will happen if the total torque of external forces is zero? If this, if this quantity is zero, then the time derivative of angular momentum is zero. And if time derivative is zero, then the angular momentum remains constant. So in this case, angular momentum remains constant, both in direction and in magnitude. And that is the law of conservation of angular momentum, which I told you is the consequence of the Aminotter's uh, theorem which is uh, which takes into account the isotropic symmetry of space that is the equivalence of all directions and that's why there is the law of conservation of momentum uh, I will show you a simple experiment uh, demonstrating the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, that's a small ball on a thread, and there is a small hole in the center of this table. And if I allow the ball to move, then what forces act on this ball? The forces of gravity and the reaction of the table surface balance each other. They cancel. Their sum is zero. So we don't take them into account. The vertical forces are balanced. And the only unbalanced force remains he remaining here is the force of tension of this thread. And this force of tension is directed to the center. The force is direct directed along the radius vector. This is the radius vector. And if we calculate the momentum uh, the torque acting on this ball with respect to this point, the center point is O, then we will have to take the uh, vector product of this radius vector and the force of tension having the same direction. It's directed along the thread. So the two vectors having the same direction will give you zero product. A vector product includes the sine of angle between these two forces and the angle is zero because the two because the force and the radius vector uh, have the same direction so the angle between these two vectors is zero and the sine is zero and therefore the vector product is zero and it means that the torque the torque of this force of tension is zero and if the torque is zero then the according to the law of conservation the angular momentum should remain zero. And that results in interesting, in such an interesting phenomenon that when I change the radius uh, of rotation, something will be, something will happen here. Look. What happens? The velocity is increasing. When I pull the string downward, I reduce the radius of rotation and the velocity increases. 
when the radius increases, the velocity decreases. That's, that phenomenon is described by the law of conservation of momentum. What is the magnitude of this uh, angular momentum? By definition, it's uh, the length of radius vector times the momentum. The momentum is mass times velocity, and that quantity remains constant. So that the velocity of this ball is some constant C divided by mass times radius. So when the radius is decreased, the velocity increases. the velocity of the ball increases when the radius decreases. If the radius is uh, halved, is reduced by a factor of two, then the velocity will increase by a factor of two. It will increase two times if we go to a smaller radius, twice as small as it was. That's the consequence of the law of conservation of momentum which, which we have just derived. The velocity is inversely proportional to the radius. So if you look at this experimental demonstration again, uh, you will notice that uh, it's not merely the angular velocity which is increasing, but the velocity is increasing of this ball. It's not merely the angular velocity. Certainly, the angular velocity increases, but the velocity of motion increases. velocity increases. So suppose the initial radius uh, and final radius in this experiment just differ in two times, so that final radius is the initial radius divided by 2. Then final velocity at final point will be twice the initial velocity. And final energy, mb squared, will equal m. Velocity final is twice the velocity initial. When I square, I will obtain 4 velocity initial velocity squared over 2. So if I denote by k initial, the initial kinetic energy, then the final kinetic energy of the ball will be four times the initial kinetic energy. The initial kinetic energy is mv squared over 2, where v is the initial velocity, but the final velocity is twice the initial velocity. So the final kinetic energy is four times the initial kinetic energy. In this experiment, the kinetic energy of this ball increases when the radius of its rotation decreases. When the kinetic energy changes, it means that some force performed some work. Some force performed a work on this ball. It's impossible to change kinetic energy without a work. Work should be performed on this ball. So how can you imagine it? The ball rotates along the circle, and here is the thread, and the force is directed here, 
and the force is perpendicular to the velocity of the ball. How does this force perform work? Actually, if the ball rotates along an ideal circle, circular trajectory, then its velocity is perpendicular to the force, and each small displacement dr is perpendicular to the force. And therefore, the work performed, uh, the small amount of work on small displacement, which is a scalar product of work and displacement, will be zero if displacement is perpendicular to the force, because scalar product includes cosine of angle, cosine of angle between force and displacement. But in this particular experiment, the ball was moving along a spiral trajectory. It was not a perfect circle. It was a spiral. And when you have a spiral, in this case, the velocity is not perpendicular to the force. The di small displacement, angle between small displacement and the force will be different from 90 degrees. And that's why the force of tension of this uh, thread performs work in this experiment, because the ball moves along the spiral trajectory. Let's make sure that this is true, this assumption works. Let's calculate this work. So suppose the initial radius was this one, and the final radius was twice as small. And that will be the final radius. And that is the initial radius. Let's calculate the work performed in this motion when we reduce the radius by a factor of 2. So the work performed in this process, according to definition, will be an integral from the initial radius to final radius. And here is the force as a function of radius and dr. I don't consider uh, the angle between these two vectors uh, because I believe that the motion is very small, very, s very slow, and the spiral is very close to, uh, very close to uh, an ideal circle, so that the angle between them is very close to 90 degrees. But the force is directed along the radius so that the angle between the force and the radius vector is 0, uh, and the cosine of 0 is unity. You see, this is the radius, and the force acting on the particle is directed here. So the force of tension coincides in direction with the radius vector of the of the particle with the radius vector. Uh, so when I move the ball closer and closer here, I apply the force, which is the force of tension, and the ball moves finally by some delta r, by some, uh, some displacement, some distance delta r. I don't take into account the displacement in perpendicular direction, perpendicular to radius, because this displacement does is perpendicular to force. It does not perform work. I take into account only the displacement along the radius. Here, in this formula, I take into account only the displacement along the radius, not perpendicular to the radius, because perpendicular displacement along the circular trajectory does not perform work. The work is performed only by the force which is uh, directed along the displacement, which is along the change in radius. Uh, 
So what will be the force of tension of a thread in this experiment? A force of tension, according to the Newton's second law, is the mass of this ball multiplied by an acceleration, centripetal acceleration, which is the velocity of the ball squared over radius. And the velocity itself is a function of radius, dr. Also, I have to take into account here a very important thing. I consider the final radius to be smaller than the initial radius. So I go from large radius to smaller radius. It means that dr will be negative. It means that I will obtain negative work. So in order to take into account that negative, that minus sign, I will put it here immediately from the very beginning. I know that I will obtain negative value for work because the force is, if the force is positive, then dr is negative. It's, it goes from larger to smaller uh, values. Mass is constant. It can be taken out of the integral sign, r rf. So here we obtain velocity squared. How can we calculate velocity? According to the law of conservation of momentum, look at this formula. Velocity is inversely proportional to radius. And uh, I will take exactly this formula to calculate the velocity as a function of radius. That's what I need in this integration. I need the function, the dependence between velocity and radius. So I put here this formula, which is some constant divided by mass and radius. And that's the velocity. That's the velocity according to this formula. That's the velocity dependence versus radia, radius. And uh, why do I know that this is the velocity? Because of the law of conservation of angular momentum. Only, but this is because of the law. And velocity squared, I take the square, and what remains here is dr divided by r. So the mass as a coefficient remains in its place. Another mass squared will go to denominator, and c as a constant squared will go to nominator. So c squared divided by m squared, integral of r initial to r final. And what remains under the integral? Under the integral sign, I will have radius squared times radius. That is radius to the power of 3. I will have to take such an integral. You know the general formula. If you take the integral of x to the power of k dx, the result will be x to the power k plus 1 divided by k plus 1. In our particular integral, k equals minus 3, because we have radius to the power of minus 3. Radius is in de denominator. So if k equals minus 3, then the result him here will be what? The result will be, I, I certainly I take here, I uh, cancel one mass, and what, what is in the coefficient c squared divided by m. And uh, if k equals minus 3, then the result here will be uh, radius minus 2 divided by minus 2. And that should be taken in the limits of initial radius and final radius. So that will give me c squared over 
1 minus will come here, minus 2m. And first, I will take this expression in the final point, which will be radius final to the prime power of minus 2 minus radius initial to the power of minus 2. I will take 1 minus into the round brackets. And finally, I will obtain c squared divided by mass. And here is initial radius 1 over initial radius squared minus 1 over final radius squared. And if I assume that the final radius is just half the initial radius, final radius is the initial radius by, by 2, then I obtain here c squared over m remains in its place. And here is, a, here is 1 over r initial squared minus 4 divided by r initial squared. Because final radius is the initial radius divided by 2. 2 will go to the nominator and squared. 2 times 2 is 4. And so that will give me 1 minus 4, that is minus 3 c squared over m radius initial squared. And what is c? Now we can now we can use this formula that C is MVR. MVR. So this is minus 3. M squared, V initial squared, uh, R initial squared, divided by M, R initial squared. That will give you minus 3. M will cancel, one uh, radius will cancel. Uh, I lost, some. yeah, I lost this 2. Remember, this 2 coefficient is lost. It was here, but I, I have forgotten about it here. Certainly, this coefficient of 2 is necessary. And what remains here is M v initial squared divided by 2. What remains is m v initial squared divided by 2. And this is nothing but the initial kinetic energy. So what I remain is minus 3 initial kinetic energy. And that's what? That is minus work performed. So the total work performed is 3 initial kinetic energy in this process. If I move this ball in such a way that the initial radius, final radius, is just half the initial radius. So what remains to be done is that we know the law of conservation, or the law of change of kinetic energy. Final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy must be equal to the work performed. In our case, final kinetic energy is 4k, that is 4k initial, and the work performed is 3k initial. We have just derived it. We have just proven that the work is 3k initial. So does it work? 4 minus 1 equals 3. Yes, we have proven by this integration that the work performed on this rotating ball, the work performed by the force of tension, 
is exactly equal to the change in kinetic energy of this ball. So the change of kinetic energy is not a surprise. It's natural. It's according to the laws of physics. And it's equal to the work performed on, on this ball, work performed by the force of tension in the string. Because when I pull the tension, because when I pull the string downward, I perform some work. I pull the string downward, down, and some work is performed. Certainly. I perform some work, and due to this work, the kinetic energy of this ball increases due to the work performed by the force of tension in the string. So we have considered this important experiment. And you may understand that this experiment represents any situation where you have a central field forces, a central forces. Central forces are gravitational forces or electrostatic forces uh, in classical physics. Uh, gravitational forces, uh, we discussed it. Uh, the gra forces of gravity uh, form a central field. And in the central field, uh, total mechanical energy is conserved because a central field is a conservative field. We proved it last time that a central field is a conservative field. And uh, so that the mechanical energy should be conserved. And we, we have proven it on a particular example, on special example of such a ball rotating and the work performed by uh, the force of tension. But similar uh, situation arises when, for example, two charged particles rotate about one another. If, one, if they are oppositely charged and there is a force of attraction between the two charged particles, and one charged particle is heavy, like a nucleus in, in the atom, and another charged particle is very light, like an electron, then according to classical physics, the electron will rotate about the proton, about the nucleus. And in this motion, uh, the electron will move with acceleration. And you will learn later that any charged particle moving with acceleration should radiate, radiate energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. And so it should lose its energy. And the electron should move according to such uh, energy loss, loss. It should move not along the circular orbit, but along some spiral trajectory and move and becomes close and closer to the central positive charge. That is according to the classical physics uh, understanding. But electrons do not fall on nucleus. On nucleus, electrons do not fall. And that is purely quantum mechanical effect, which, is, which differs from classical understanding. Classical physics will not allow you to understand uh, the stability of atoms. From classical point of view, electron moves should move uh, and radiate energy and lose energy, and therefore it should move along some circ along some uh, spiral trajectory and, and move close and closer to the central positive charge, and finally fall on it. But that doesn't happen, actually. Uh, but sometimes similar thing happens if you consider two gravitating bodies, like two neutron stars. If a double star consists of two neutron stars, then they are gravitating, and they rotate one uh, about the other, and they radiate gravitational wave. And gravitational wave takes some energy away. And so that the energy, total energy of rotating uh, neutron stars is reducing, in, is diminishing in time. It's the system is losing energy due to gravitational radiation. And in this particular case, the neutron stars will move uh, along some spiral trajectory close and closer to each other, and they will radiate gravitational wave uh, 
with higher and higher frequency because they move quicker and quicker, just like what we have observed here with this ball. The same happens in the system of two heavy neutron stars if, the, if they are uh, members of double star and they move in the same way and radiate gravitational wave and they move quicker and quicker when they come closer and closer until they collide and stick together and make some object of larger mass. <coughs> and uh, such an astronomical event may be observed and may be measured and all these events, something like that happens in real life, in astronomy, in, in the behavior of double stars. Something like that happens, what you have observed here with this ball. So this is very important phenomenon. And what we have considered here is very important to understand because this will allow you to understand many interesting, <coughs> many interesting things. Uh, finally, I would, I would like to tell you about uh, the angular momentum with respect to a particular axis. So consider some body like a disk, a solid disk rotating, or which can rotate, about the axis. So this is a solid disk rotating. Let it be axis z. If the disk has some mass, it's a massive disk, it consists of many points. Each individual point has some mass. So the whole disk is massive, and it's rotating, and each point has some velocity, and so it has some momentum. And therefore, there is some angular momentum of this disk. And the angular momentum will be directed uh, along the z-axis, and the direction can be found easily by introducing the right screw, which rotates in the same way. And if the screw is rotating here, then it will move in this direction. So that will be the direction of the total angular momentum of this body, this rotating disk. And this angular momentum <coughs> will be uh, directed along the z-axis. So we may consider just a z-component of angular momentum, z-component. <coughs> uh, OK, what happens next? We will finish, mm, finish next time, uh, the day after tomorrow. And uh, on this point, let it be the end of this lecture. So let's finish.